Welcome to the 13th Pythagorean Order of Death podcast, or the uh, POD podcast. As always, I'm your host, uh, Jonathan Barlow G., Reverend Jonathan Barlow G., of course, of the THC ministry, the Hawaiian Cannabis Ministry, uh, originally. I am a cantheist. Uh, I believe that uh, consumption of cannabis plant uh, marijuana is uh, a sacrament to uh, a higher power. In this 13th installment, I'll be uh, addressing some questions asked by Andrus Lux. Uh, about the Pythagorean order of death itself, uh, about the POD. So uh, I'll be asking, I'll be answering 10 questions of his, uh, which should take probably about an hour and a half, I'd guess, perhaps a little less or a little more. Uh, but for anybody keeping count, uh, I'd guess about that. So without further ado, uh, let's get right to the questions. Uh, his first question is, what is the confusion of the tongues and how has ESP been misdiagnosed? Whenever speaking of the confusion of the tongues, we are referring to an event in biblical mythology related in Genesis 11, verses 1 through 9. In this verse, we are told, not long after the world flood, the Lord punished mankind for making a name for themselves by building a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. As previously to this, the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. The Lord brought about the confusion of the tongues to punish humanity's early ambitions. Therefore, Genesis 11.9 explains, is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth and from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. Of course, nowadays we recognize this as merely an allusion to the old Babylonian empire, founded by the Amorite king Hammurabi, after he ascended to the throne there in 1792 BC. However, the city of Babylon and state of Babylonia were already existent then. The town originally called itself Can Digarak from Ka Digir Ra Ki, meaning in Sumerian, Gate of the Gods, or Bab Elim in Akkadian from Bar Ki Bar, where the NC governor, built a temple to Marduk. This is the root for the etymologies of words like babbling in English, meaning to speak nonsense in a stream of consciousness, and like barbarian from ancient Greek, meaning all non-Greek speaking peoples. The event described in Genesis is clearly meant to reflect upon the original rise of the old Babylonian empire under Hammurabi, who wrote one of the earliest legal codes and had it etched in stone. However, we know that already by that period in time historically, there were already multiple different languages and dialects present in the ancient Levant alone, let alone the various different populated areas around the world which by that time included regions in South America, China, India, and Egypt as well. The beginning of the old Babylonian Empire marked the end of what we call today the Neo-Sumerian Empire of the Akkadian period, 
from around 2350 to around 2000 BC, which began when Ernamu killed the ruler of Lagash and became the king of Sumer and Akkad in 2112 BC. Even by the reign of Sargon, beginning 2334 BC, the spoken language of the Levant had become Akkadian, while the written language remained Sumerian. This situation is somewhat similar to the much later, from 1800 to 1450 BC, parity of Linear A, Minoan, and Linear B, Mycenaean, forms of Early Greek. The common difference between these two is in dialect, with Minoan and Sumerian being used for written texts, while Mycenaean and Akkadian were mainly spoken languages. Sumerian and Akkadian were both written in cuneiform letters, however, while Linear A and B each are their own alphabets. A similar difference also occurred in Egypt between the hieroglyphic and hieratic priestly scripts and the later Demotic or common dialect written in the Coptic cipher, although, again, this occurred much later as well, from between 3000 BC, when hieratic began, to around 650 BC, when Demotic became dominant. Likewise, the decline of ESP, telepathy, and clairvoyance, let alone telekinesis, has been a gradual process as well, beginning even before the origins of the first writing, confer the Kish tablet from Sumer some 3,500 BC, with the origins of spoken language, possibly dating as far back as to Artipithecus Ramatus, a hominid from approximately 4.5 million years ago. Clearly, the Broca and Wernicke areas of the brain are significant in this shift. How is unknown. What is the mind's five-dimensional invisible hand, and how is this used with creative visualization slash projection to transmit thoughts. To start with, any object in one dimension will cast a shadow beneath it in the next lower dimension. So, for the most obvious example, a three-dimensional sphere will cast as its shadow a two-dimensional circle. A three-dimensional cube will cast a square shadow, and so on. Just so, a two-dimensional shape will cast a one-dimensional shadow, and a four-dimensional form will cast a three-dimensional shadow. We measure the shadow of the fourth dimension by its effect on three-dimensional space as change over time. In other words, the shadow of four space is motion in three space, that is to say, time itself. Since Einstein, space-time has been understood as the three-dimensional shape of the present cosmos plus its one-directional past sum over histories, usually expressed these days as a light cone, emanating from the Big Bang at the cone's tip and terminating in the relatively flat surface of our current universe at the cone's base. Hence, space-time as a whole is seen as four-dimensional. So, if everything up to the speed of light, and thus inside the borders of our local universe, is considered four-space, then hyperspace that field of faster than light, FTL, zero point energy, ZPE, beyond and underlying this must be five dimensional. So, hyperspace is a five dimensional light source 
shining onto 4D space-time from outside it that causes space-time to cast the shadow of 1D motion into 3 space, etc. Classically, these fourth and fifth dimensional aspects of the electromagnetic spectrum were referred to as the illusory and impermanent lesser light below light speed and the constant and unchanging greater light above light speed. So just as the aura of a person or any living being may be a toroidal field of electromagnetic energy surrounding their body, it becomes a unique soul as it develops its own patterns of this energy's ebbs and flows. The motion of energy on the toroidal surface of the aura over time determines the nature of any person's soul given their extant karma, whether more good or evil. This motion of energy, the soul, is itself a one-directional shadow, time, cast onto a three-dimensional object, the aura, from a higher dimensional object in the fourth dimension, lit by the fifth dimensional greater light of hyperspace. This fourth spatial form that casts the shadow of motion onto the aura is called the Merkava in Kabbalah, describing the throne chariot of God. This four-dimensional Merkava surrounds and animates the soul as the aura surrounds the living being's body. Just as the aura acts as a container for the mind while the being is alive, so, theoretically, the mind may be transferred as a soul into this Merkava vehicle and thus survive the death of its body. The mind itself, although inhabiting a three-dimensional body as a four-dimensional soul, is thought to be of the same substance as the ZPE field of hyperspace. That is to say, the individual mind is thought to be comprised of the same substance as 5D hyperspace. Of course, this is merely a substantive similarity and not reflected in size scale. An individual mind, in its living aura, is like a thimble full of water, while the universal mind of hyperspace is like an ocean. Nevertheless, this leads to the creative visualization of the individual mind as being a five-dimensional hand that is, an appendage on a higher dimensional form of being. Thus, there are three regular polygons in two space, and only three regular polytopes, platonic solids, in five dimensions and all above. This is because the pentagon is the largest 2D polygon, and this also explains why almost all animal species on Earth, even starfish, have five extremities at the ends of their primary appendages. How did you map the topology of the tree of knowledge and tree of life? Firstly, according to the myth regarding Adam and Eve in Eden, Genesis 3 of the Torah, they ate the forbidden fruit from the tree of knowledge, and thus were exiled from Eden, and a flaming sword was placed between mankind and the tree of life. So today, the tree of life diagram of HaKabalah is a depiction of what we consider our substitute for that which we had in Eden, that was, as promised by God in Genesis 2.16, the tree of life that gave Adam and Eve immortality. This modern substitute for the tree of life in paradise is itself the tree of knowledge. Now, because like the herb of the field, Genesis 3, 18, that we are condemned to eat instead of the fruits of immortality. Now become like 
Just as the tree of knowledge in Eden became the modern tree of life diagram of HaKabalah, the tree of life in Eden became a tree of death for humanity in exile. To study these trees in, as they would have appeared in Eden, we must examine both the modern tree of life diagram of HaKabalah, but also the modern tree of death diagram of the Cliffoth. In examining the modern tree of life diagram of HaKabalah, there are no short supply of models available. The most modern tree of life diagrams of HaKabalah display the slippage of the middle pillar from the earliest format for its design, which was based on a double cube model. In this earlier model, called the Gra in the Sefer Yetzirah edition by Arya Kaplan, the 12 signs of the zodiac can correspond to the horizontal legs and the seven classical planets of antiquity to the vertical legs. So it is this Gra model for the Tree of Life diagram of modern Kabbalah we can associate with the Tree of Knowledge in Eden. The only or most unique, now known to me at least, model for a modern tree of death comes from the double diamond design given by Steve Savidow. This design would then symbolize the original tree of life in Eden. Given the layout of the Garden of Eden, as described in Genesis 2 9, we may postulate the forbidden tree of knowledge was the tallest tree centralmost in the orchard, surrounded by shorter trees that bore the fruit of immortality. Thus, we may further speculate, the tree of knowledge may be the shape that the tree of life would eventually grow into. In short, the double diamond design of the modern tree of death may symbolize a pair of tetrahedrons, just as the double cube design for the modern tree of life symbolizes a pair of cubes, or, to be more succinct, a single cube over time, a tesseract, or fourth spatial dimensional hypercube. So the double tetrahedron may symbolize the conjoined format of these shapes as a stellated octahedron shape, being a sapling grown from the seed of a single tetrahedron. With the double cube model of the tree of knowledge bearing the forbidden fruit being this shape's next phase of evolution following the intermediary phase of bearing the fruit of immortal life. Then, by combining the double diamond diagram of the tree of death, actually the tree of life in Eden, and the double cube diagram of the tree of life, actually the tree of knowledge in Eden, we may arrive at the design I call the Jacob's Ladder that, speculatively, may represent the next phase in growth of this symbolical tree model. What is a Tao sub Tao tesseract, and how is it able to measure tachyons? A tesseract, or hypercube, is a four-space shape symbolizing a single cube over time as a pair of conjoined or nested cubes. So, symbolically, one can depict the shape of the fourth spatial dimension as a tesseract, since the fourth spatial dimension necessarily supersedes the three dimensions of our local universe and the one direction of time as we experience it herein, we can measure our cosmos as extending beyond these three and a half dimensions of our local universe into the fourth spatial dimension of space-time. Now, if we assign number sets to distances in space-time, we may observe that space-time exceeds our local observable universe by an indeterminate, undefined, and potentially limitless amount. Thus, we can call 4D space-time truly infinite. 
if we continue counting out further into the cosmos beyond space-time, we arrive at a torus with our local universe as its core. This can be likened to the Aleph or transfinite number set. Just as our local universe is temporary, it had a beginning, the Big Bang, and it will have an eventual end in heat death when all matter energy returns to pure ZPE. So too is hyperspace, the energy field that existed before the Big Bang and which will exist after universal heat death. But even this is finite, merely being the boundary of a gravitational singularity containing our local cosmos as a baby universe inside it. The Taurus-shaped cycle of cosmic big bangs and heat deaths in the gravitational singularity of hyperspace is likewise the nested core inside the larger hypersphere describing this gravitational singularity itself. And just as the local universe is at the core of the 4D shape of space-time, and labeled with transfinite number set maximum sums. So too is the cyclical torus of our local cosmos, labeled as Aleph sub N, and the larger sphere of the gravity well containing this, labeled as Aleph sub Omega. Between the gravity well and the event horizon of the metacosmic black hole containing our own cosmos as its baby universe, we can label a tesseract as tau sub tau, indicating the largest possible, now known, number set to symbolize the border of local cosmic time. Beyond this tau sub tau tesseract, surrounding the local cosmos, Combining the cyclical Taurus model of our reincarnating cosmos with the local universe and hyperspace surrounding it is the event horizon of a larger black hole inside a yet still larger parent cosmos. However, because we do not yet know the physical, mathematical, and geometric nature of this parent cosmos, we can only be certain that time itself exists up to the level of the Tau sub Tau Tesseract in this model. <clears throat> Can you explain the meaning of the POD Atlantean star? The POD star is a symbol comprised geometrically of five pentagrams surrounding a central pentagon containing a slightly smaller pentagram at its center. Color-coded, one of these surrounding five pentagrams is green, symbolizing the public or spirit element. One is pink or indigo on yellow, symbolizing the earth element one blue on orange, symbolizing water, one yellow on pink, symbolic of air, and the last orange on blue, symbolic of fire. The pentagon they all surround is purple, or violet, signifying cosmos, and the smaller pentagram in the center is red, signifying man. This star also corresponds to the geometry of the floor of the Senate building in Atlantis, according to the POD materials literature. As such, it is also the shape of the board for the board game of Atlantean democracy. To this end, the central red star is surrounded by a white, or sometimes black and white tiled, square, signifying spirit as the three-step platform of the Senate, where all the moves of Atlantean democracy take place. In this variation, 
These three circular steps are labeled as the 12 zodiac signs around the lowest and largest, the seven classical planets around the middle, and three alchemical phases on top. What is the hell dimension? In the many worlds interpretation of quantum level phenomenon, the operant observer principle, or some variety of it, causes the unlimited bifurcation of possible timelines. In such a branching model for timelines, one inhabits their native timeline without ever knowing of those that split off around them. However, necessary differences exist between each timeline. Like snowflakes, no two are identical. So, for example, a nearer timeline in this model of a multiverse may be more similar, while another timeline further away in this model may be drastically different in every detail besides, of course, the essential laws of physics necessary for it to maintain cohesion as a timeline. So, in one timeline, red may be red. In the neighboring timelines, red may be more pink or more garnet. In a further timeline, what they consider red may be closer to what we would call blue, etc. So let's posit that one of these distinguishing characteristic traits of differentiation between these otherwise dimensionally parallel timelines is luck. So for any individual, they may inhabit a timeline that is either more or less lucky for them, or even, by some twist of fate or random chance, find themselves transported from one timeline in which they have luck that is more or less good or bad into another neighboring timeline in which their luck is the opposite. So if you have a near-death experience, you may find yourself experiencing the judgment of your karma scenario, often experienced by the dying and by those undergoing a large dose of DMT. If you find yourself judged worthy, your luck may improve. You may have used the experience, like a rung on a ladder, to elevate yourself out of a less lucky timeline into a more lucky one above or superior to your past. However, if your superego judges your karma and finds you unworthy, you may wake up finding your luck has greatly swayed for the worse. In such a case, it may not be inaccurate to describe the event as landing you into a lower or worse timeline relative to your past. Of course, such placement of purely moral value for such is luck as a measure of karma. Onto branching timelines is not just arbitrary as per individual and per time, but also wrongly implies some force alike gravity responsible for dragging us down into less lucky timelines that we attempt to overcome and escape from toward luckier ones. In truth, no such force necessarily exists. From this point of view, compared to one's native timeline, any more lucky, any more unlucky timeline would be a hell dimension, and any more lucky timeline a heaven dimension. Hence, likewise, a popular utopia constitutes a better future timeline for a group of any size while a prevailing dystopia indicates a worse future timeline where the luck of the individual and the collective are generally on a decline. Can you explain the relationship between Yeshua ben Padia and Hassan ibn Sabah? Yeshua ben Padia was, supposedly, the author of an apocryphal grimoire from the Gospels era called the Angel Scroll, 
that may be a missing link between the earlier Enochian apocryphal tradition and the later medieval European Solomonic grimoires. According to the Sanhedrin trial documents of Yeshu, whom Christians worship as the Messiah, they compared Yeshu to one Bar Pandera, who, according to the Toledoth Yeshu, a Dark Ages apocrypha, stole a holy name from a temple in Egypt by hiding it within, uh, written on a small scroll inside a cut he made on his skin. Yeshu Bar Pandera then used this holy name to perform miracles, as did Jesus, according to the Gospels, cure the sick using only the power of his word. Whether the Bar Pandera referred to in the Sanhedrin trial documents and in Taladoth Yeshu, Toledoth Yeshu, is the same person as Jesus of Nazareth, called the Christ in the Gospels, or whether either of these is the same person as the alleged author of the Angel Scroll remains unknown as of now, late 2023 A.D., the beginning of the first era of the Aeon of Gemini, some 2,000 years ago, and the end of this first era, was the ascension to the perch of Alamud by the old man of the mountain, Hassan e Sabah, around some 1050 until 1124 AD. Book and the first era in the direct midst of which we find the lifetime of the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, from around 570 to 632 AD. So one can point out, just as Jesus reigned during a changing of the aeons, Muhammad ruled at the first apex point to follow this. So we find the old man of the mountain, Hassan e Sabah, to be an interesting syncretism of traits expressed both by Jesus in his gospel teachings and by Muhammad in the Noble Quran. The Hashishin order, begun by Sabah, relied on terror tactics to spread its influence throughout the Crusades era holy lands. Sabah learned from the apparent mistake of Jesus' ultimate pacifism and from the militant activism of the Prophet of Islam. In Aphorism 16 of the Gnostic Apocryphal Gospel of Thomas, Jesus said, Perhaps people think that I have come to cast peace upon the world. They do not know that I have come to cast conflicts upon the world. Fire, sword, war. For there will be five in a house, there will be three against two, and two against three, father against son, and son against father, and they will stand alone. And so, too, in Matthew 10, 34 through 36, it is written, Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I come not to send peace, but a sword. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father, and the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's foes shall be they of his own household. In the Noble Quran, Surat 9, verse 73 and 66, verse 9, the prophet admonishes, Strive against the disbelievers with the sword, and against the hypocrites with your tongue. Taking such sayings as these to heart, Sabah founded the Assassin's Order on a false promise of an afterlife in paradise made to the Fidiyin, literally meaning, in Arabic, those who sacrifice themselves attainable only on the grounds they murder in the name of and are prepared to die themselves for the cult. Some speculate that the assassin's order used hashish, 
made by mixing marijuana keef with poppy resin exclusively for the function of mind control over its members. However, it is just as likely such a large-scale secret society could not have operated without the additional telepathic powers this drug can imbue. The assassins flourished from 1090 until 1275 AD and had outlived their founder by two further generations, when they finally surrendered to the Mongol invasion of Persia. So, essentially, we find the first era of the last aeon began with Yeshua ben Padia and concluded with the lifetime of Hassani Sabah, and that between these two came the Hijra of Muhammad in 622 AD. What is the calendar of the solar aeons, and how, specifically, is it understood? <clears throat> the calendar of the solar aeons may be understood one of two ways, either purely by adhering to the actual portions of the ecliptic occupied by each zodiac sign, as these each differ from every other, even if only slightly, or else, ideally, by considering each of the 12 zodiac signs to occupy a span of 30 degrees on a perfectly circular 360-degree ecliptic plane. Thus, 12 times 30 equals 360. Assuming it makes no difference to this description which one we use, we may choose the idealist over the purest model for now, as the idealist model is easier to work with. In the ideal model of a calendar based on this method of measuring the 360 degree... <laughs> In the ideal model of a calendar based on this method of measuring the 12 signs of the zodiac as spans of 30 degrees each, we find this to be very nearly identical to measuring the 360 degree circle as alike the 365 day year. In the resulting model for a calendar, corresponding essentially to the ancient Egyptian civic solar calendar model, each month is 30 days. The extra five days were celebrated as the Heru Renpet holidays at the two equinoxes, two solstices, and one annual New Year's Eve dates. The model of the calendar of months counts the order of the 12 zodiac signs as they rise on the horizon at dawn over the year. Such megalithic monuments as Stonehenge seem to have been built to measure such phenomena. The model of the calendar of the aeons counts the order of the 12 zodiac signs as they rise on the horizon at dawn over the thousands of years. Due to precession of the Earth's 23.5 degree axial tilt around true north, each of the 12 zodiac signs will rise on the horizon at dawn on the same days of the year for roughly 2,000 years before they roll over into the next aeonic month. So, ideally, each month of 30 days per annual calendar round may be seen as roughly equivalent to an aeon of 2,000 years per 30 degrees per aeonic calendar round. The precession of the 12 zodiac signs around the calendar of the solar aeons is opposite that during an annual orbit. Say you take an idealized square day-by-day -day calendar, with each month being 30 days, and you arrange its pages so that they form a circle. This is the calendar round. Now, if one progresses monthly around this circle in one direction, say clockwise, 
one will progress around the same circle in the opposite direction, in this case counterclockwise, if measuring the spans of 30-day months as aeons of 2,000 years apiece. This effect occurs due to the axial pole of the planet Earth processing east to west very gradually, while the Earth rotates daily west to east. The POD has various examples of solar aeon calendar systems, including the Lemurian, the Pythagorean version proper, and the Atlantean, each a varying degree of complexity. All these aeonic calendars of the POD are calibrated the same, to be read as if looking east along the equator at dawn on the winter solstice, and oriented to depict the ruling planets as of the year nominal zero on the current calendar of B.C. and A.D. dating eras. As such, the nadir point of each calendar round in the P.O.D., depicting an aeonic cycle, occurs between the zodiac signs of Cancer and Gemini, with the moon ruling Cancer and the sun ruling Gemini, because these are the rising signs on the horizon at dawn on the winter solstice during these different periods of time. On this model, we are already now leaving the aeon when the ruling signs are Gemini in winter, Pisces in spring, Sagittarius in summer, and Virgo in autumn, and entering a new aeon when the ruling signs are Taurus in winter, Aquarius in spring, Scorpio in summer, and Leo in autumn. These will now be the ruling signs for the next around 2,000 years or so. The purpose of keeping long counts of dates spanning thousands of years is more than just as a mnemonic for remembering history, though it helps. It is for remembering our current place in the planet's ice age cycle. For example, the eon we are entering into now, governed by Taurus in winter, is actually in the early to mid-autumn of the Ice Age cycle's 48,000-year-long span for the North Hemisphere, equivalent to early to mid-spring in the South Hemisphere. This means the glaciers will begin thawing over Antarctica and begin forming over the North Pole, likely Siberia, gradually over the next 6,000 to 12,000 years or so. Such are the seasons on the calendar of aeons. <clears throat> Can you expand on the five bond cult groups and the psychic pope? The five Bund groups in the POD each act alike a political party within the global government of Atlantis as a psychic democracy. Each Bund party member is associated with one of the five platonic solids and issued a role among the bench of five masters in an elemental lodge and among the bench of five senators whenever the Atlantean Senate convenes by combining these five elemental lodges. In Lodge, the oldest of the Bund groups reigns, but in Senate, the youngest of them rules. That is to say that nowadays, the group called within the POD, the Essene Zealots, play the role of Grand Master in the elemental lodges, because they are the eldest, and that, within the Senate, the Bund group called in the POD, the Bohemian camp, sit in the area chairs above the rest who remain benched, because they are the youngest of these cults. In modern times, 
The Essene Zealots branch corresponds to the York Rite Freemasons, and the Bohemian camp title belongs to the Ordo Templi Orientis. However, it should be noted that at one time, 2,000 years ago, the Essene Zealots were the equivalent to the modern OTO. That is to say, they were the youngest among the five Bund sects. Just so, at a time some 2,000 years hence, should we not blow ourselves up first, the Bohemian camp of the OTO will be the oldest group among the Bund then, and some other, as of yet entirely unforeseeable group, will arise as the youngest party. Each of the Bund parties occupies each of the five Bund roles for 500 years before rolling over into the next slot down. So, from 1,500 years ago, the group called in the POD, the Knights Zion, began. From 1,000 years ago, the group called the Regal Rosicrucians. From 500 years ago began the Illuminati Golden Dawn group, and nowadays we have the OTO as reformed 100 years ago by Crowley. <clears throat> While the role of a Lemurian pope as laid out regarding an Atlantean democracy format for government is, has always been, and always will be voluntary and by election, the roles in the order of death of an inner head of the order, an IHO, and an outer head of the order, an OHO, have been continuous for at least so long as written history has existed to keep track of them. So if Yeshu ben Padia was an IHO, and Muhammad, peace be upon him, an OHO, and so Hassan e Sabah, an IHO, and Hugh D. Pienz, an OHO, Jacques de Molay, an IHO, and so Trithemius, an OHO, and John D., an IHO, and so Roger Bacon, an OHO, and Adam Weishaupt, an IHO, and so Eliphas Levy, an OHO, and Crowley, an IHO, of the Psychic Order of Death, and so on. So, in a sense, all these people held the role of Pope of the P.O.D. during their times, and this itself was an honorific often belonging to more than one person at once. In this order of death system, it is assumed all willing participants are also informed telepaths, that is to say, by any means, initiates. However, there is room left open for people to hold the office of Pope of the P.O.D., not just without knowingly being psychic, but without realizing they are manifesting as such. Someone who does not know they are psychic is called a member of the cult of sleep in the P.O.D.'s circles and called a member of the public in Atlantean democracy. When such a person becomes a Pope in the P.O.D.'s circles, they may be unable to read the minds of others, but everyone else can easily read their mind. As there are, thus, five bund groups whose IHO and OHO popes of the order of death arise every 500 years or so, they entirely reset once about every eon or span of 2,000 years. Insofar as that, the seasons of the popes may be a useful document to study as well. How is the unification of all cult sects accomplished? The unification of all sects begins by offering the leaders of these cults a role in a truly active and functional international bond of multiple occult orders and secret societies, and to act, for now behind the scenes, as it were, as part of a de facto world government. The goal of such an international bond would be to establish a global government based on ideological pluralism and ideal number theory, 
comprised of practicing occultists and self-styling magicians. The allure of authority over world affairs using the arts of Solomonic magic is not a new concept. However, creating a bond as like a United Nations of modern occultists may be an idea whose time has come at last, given the Internet's ability to link people around the planet more or less simultaneously. Of course, students of history are all rightly wary of the idea from every angle. Since the era of the Delian League in ancient, Egypt, in ancient Greece, through the 20th century League of Nations into the current United Nations with five permanent member nations on a security council and a congress of all other nations in the General Assembly, the idea of complete and singular worldwide governmental rule has always been a bad one. Likewise, the idea of bringing together competing schools of esoteric belief systems with vastly conflicting ideologies and creeds is also doomed to fail, as demonstrated by Crowley's inability to more than plant and cultivate seed lodges of the OTO, which organization he had hoped would serve as a bond organization in and of itself. The York and Scottish rites of Freemasonry, ma Freemasonry remain paranoid and tight-lipped about even their geometric craft secrets, such as squaring the circle, etc., fearing everything outside the strictest observance of the ancient and accepted rites as being potentially dangerous, clandestine Freemasonry. On the other end of the spectrum, the OTO of today operates countless lodges and hosts countless events with countless members and yet offers little order anymore by way of its knowledge lectures per each degree for the aspiring neophyte and primarily relies on merch sales to fund ritual orgies. The idea these extreme opposites could be brought together to negotiate the fate of the world, all under a single tentpole, to even think such an idea may be downright dangerous to today's status quo. Such a proposition is, after all, a potential threat to the existing social order. To claim you want to establish a global government as a bond alike in esoteric United Nations, unifying multiple occult orders and secret societies under one roof, may be a counterintuitive goal, even to a practicing magician particularly one who only uses sigil magic to help remind themselves to catch the bus on time, as is all too commonly the case nowadays. The fact there will likely someday be a global government remains, as well as our ability to influence its nature beforehand. I have only proposed the POD's model, models of Atlantean democracy, as an alternative to the many dystopian ideas promoted by modern futurists and science fiction authors. Of course, the POD's plans extend only so far as the recruitment and formation of such a bond as the foundation for Atlantean democracy, and so they do not mention all existing sects and orders and cults around the world today, and they pay zero heed to any existing religious creeds. There are no Jewish or Christian or Muslim degrees in the Bund, although the hidden mysteries of all are revealed within the POD material. The POD has no place for modern faiths because it respects all belief systems equally. There is no class or role that can only be played by anyone of only one particular religion, or etc., and so that wraps up the 13th POD podcast in just under an hour, actually. So isn't that interesting? Um, I uh, overestimated my, my uh, longevity or underestimated my brevity one way or the other. Uh, in any event, I've been your host, Reverend Jonathan Barlow G., uh, I thank you very much for tuning in and uh, hope you've all enjoyed hearing these 
questions and answers and that you're all having a wonderful, peaceful time uh, wherever you are. Uh, thanks again and uh, peace.